Welcome to The Hill's Coronavirus Report. I'm Steve Clemens, Editor-at-Large of The Hill. Each day we are interviewing consequential leaders and innovators in the battle against the coronavirus. In the past few months, we've heard increasingly more about supply chains, whether it's produce or meat or medical supplies, maintaining the workflow of that system of organizations and activities and companies is a critical part of our economic and physical well-being. And with the race to find a cure, or at least a viable treatment for COVID-19, there has recently been a laser focus on the drug supply chain. The Trump administration has called to relocate some streams to the United States, while others want to solidify alliances with countries who might have necessary drugs and active agents. My next guest says countries should consider building a strategic supply or stockpile of critical medications. And while the company she runs has 40 facilities worldwide, they also tout supply chain diversification and nimbleness. She says they've had minimal disruption because of that philosophy. Heather Bresch is CEO of Netherlands headquartered West Virginia founded Mylon, and she has the distinction of being the first woman to run a Fortune 500 pharmaceutical company. Her father happens to be Senator Joe Manchin of West Virginia. Heather Bresch has also served as chair of the Generic Pharmaceutical Association's Board of Directors. Heather, welcome. Great to be with you, and thanks for joining me today. I, you know, the supply chain issue has become a very big one. It's a complex world out there, but. But I want to get from you, one of the biggest uh, drug manufacturers in the world, what are the supply chain realities? Are we in trouble or are we secure? No, well, good morning, uh, Steve, and thank you for having me. I think that as we have now are all well aware, there are absolutely issues with the supply chain, as you mentioned, across many industries. However, nothing more critical than medicine at a time when you're facing a global pandemic. I think that reality of being prepared is something that that takes constant um, vigilance to build something sustainable. And I think it, even if we just start here in the United States, that's something that has never really been done. Things as I will say as simple as having a list of what are the critical medicines, that top 100, 200 products from hospital medications, ICU, important maintenance products for things like diabetes or something as simple as antibiotics to treat strep infections. We have never taken a holistic approach to that. We've re reacted to things like H1N1 or anthrax, and we've been reactive in the moment, but we've not done anything to build a strategic supply. And I think that now that COVID is giving us an opportunity, I hope to take this tragic event and really realize the importance of being prepared and having a strategic supply of critically needed medicines. I think though the other important balance to that is I've heard many governments now urgently want to create more domestic manufacturing and have talked about, well, we want to be able to manufacture everything we need for our country. When it comes to medicine, there is not a country out there that would be capable of making everything from the starting ingredients to the active uh, raw materials to the finished dosage form for all of the people in their country. It's just not remotely practical. So balancing strategic supply versus global needs is going to have to be how we look at this. And it's got to have strategic sourcing, strategic alliances with countries. I mean, we know how to do this. We, from trade, agreements to strategic alliances on many other fronts. We've just never approached our healthcare supply chain that way. And as you've rightly pointed out, it, the time is beyond come that we need to do that. Well, there's been a lot of focus, um, if I may, on China and the dependence that we have on China and the, there's a strategic competition between China and the US. Nationalism in various countries has begun to perk itself up. And there is this fear that people have that if, if we're dependent on active agents, uh, in China that we somehow are not going to be able to manage our way out there. What, what are your insights into that? Because and if I may, there's one other element of that. I saw the president say um, that you know, we need to work with all the countries in the world and you know, find a treatment, but they're blocking China out of that. And China is a place we have uh, uh, clinical trials going on in some of these drugs. So how should we deal both competitively with China, but also constructively? No, I think all of the all of that is very fair and i think the reality is steve 
no one has ever set, stepped back and really analyzed the supply chain in that way of what we're getting from where. There's no question there is an over-reliance both on intermediates as well as active pharmaceuticals and some finished dosage forms hmm. um, on China. I think that the diversification you spoke of with our supply chain, almost half of our raw materials come from China and India and almost half come from Europe or other countries. So I think as a country, countries need to look at that same diversification. As I said, you're never going to be able to say we're going to make everything we need in the United States. What we could do is have a much more strategic approach so there's not an over-reliance on any one part of the world, not only from a trade or a relationship perspective, but you never know how these how a crisis is going to hit or could take a country offline for some period of time. So I, you know, I've been in con conversations with legislators and regulators thinking about, could we be more strategic about the Western hemisphere and thinking about countries that could be natural allies to help build up their capabilities. Hmm. I think we're going to have to take a long term view on this to not only strategically be diversified, but really think about the alliances and how we're not over-reliant on any one country. Because as you know, those relationships are going to come and go and uh, and have their ups and downs. And so I think that a strategic approach to be much more diversified as a country is uh, necessary. You know, I have uh, gone on quite a journey since I've started doing these interviews, and I'm learning drug names like remdesivir and hydroxychloroquine and, you know, getting to be more versatile with those kinds of uh, names. And, and I think everyone is, is learning things they didn't know before or trying to. So on the hydroxychloroquine story, we know that Peter Navarro and people in the White House began to put their thumb and said, we need to stockpile this drug. Uh, I asked Senator Barrasso whether that was the right move, and he said, look, there, there are any number of drugs out there. We need to rush on all of them. You are one of the biggest producers in the world of hydroxychloroquine, um, I think. So what is the hydroxychloroquine story? Is, is, it, is, it, is it being uh, uh, clinically successful? Is it not? Were the steps that we took missteps? You know, Steve, I guess I'll, let me first start with this. We're not one of the largest producers. We are. We have recently ramped back up manufacturing right. of, yeah. of hydroxychloroquine from our Morgantown site. Um, and we did that as a response to whatever that need was going to be. I right. think, let me start with this. Science is important and plays a critical role in giving us information and insight to how drugs um, are working on treatments and that is a necessary step. I think that the ups and downs and the surges with hydroxy has been, we have not completely let the science vet out. And I think it's gonna be until fall, until a lot of these very large statistically significant clinical studies, until those endpoints come back. Hmm. Um, I think obviously we're seeing more anecdotal um, information that would say perhaps it's not being as effective as we had hoped. Um, and I think to your point, there's many other products, remdesivir being one that uh, I don't know if you saw, but yesterday Gilead announced partnering with companies. Mylan is one of the companies they're partnering with for us to be able to um, manufacture and produce the product. And we're going to continue to be working with them to do just that globally. So hopefully uh, when you given our platform and given the diversification, us being able to partner with governments, with other companies that we're continuing to be able to leverage this platform and be able to work very effectively and efficiently and very quickly to hopefully be able to, as science continues, as clinical trials come in, as we get more data, we're going to be able to respond to that pretty rapidly. You have a foot in Europe. You have a big foot in the United States. You know Asia well as well. Um, as you look at the science ecosystem out there, how hopeful are you that we will get some therapies and vaccines um, at the end of this race? Well, I'm, I'm very hopeful. I mean, I think if COVID hasn't done anything, it has shown not only the human spirit, the human resiliency, and the human ingenuity. And I think as we see globally really coming together, scientists from around the world, the best research in the world coming together, there's no question that we're going to, I, I very much believe, not only have treatment, but hopefully a cure. 
I think we've got to recognize time. You know, when you think back about HIV and the evolution of our understanding of that, that virus and how smart it was and how much it could manipulate itself inside the human body, that it would take a cocktail of products. It would take us years to figure out what that cocktail needed to be. When you think about something in the infectious disease, these viruses are smart. Um, and it takes time to figure out how they're going to mutate, how we build an immune response, the best effective way to treat them, whether that's one drug, multiple drugs, ultimately a vaccine. But I absolutely believe that when you when this world rallies together, as I think we are around COVID, there's no question we're going to accelerate those timelines. We're going to accelerate getting to a treatment that works. But unfortunately, the race against the tragedy of this disease and the lives it's taking between now and then is just that it's tragic. But I totally believe that um, we're going to absolutely have a treatment, um, you know, in the near future. Heather, one of the dilemmas in the in the science innovation industry and in the pharmaceutical industry is that um, there is always a tension between the property rights, the profits of, of, of and the cost of access to those drugs. Uh, and getting them to the people who may need them, who may not have those resources to buy them. So when it comes to things like affordability and cost, and we've seen, for instance, in the Hispanic community, in the, in the black community, enormous incidence and, and consequence of this disease, that's in the United States. That's before we go global and look at lesser developed countries. And you've been involved with PEPFAR in Africa and others. How do you think, do you think we're going to do the, you know, the, do the moral thing? Jim Greenwood of BIOS says I'm, you know, that he was sure that these companies would make sure that the um, drugs were available to everyone. But there are a lot of skeptics out there that say at the end of the day, we're not gonna have enough supply, uh, not everyone's gonna get it, and there are gonna be some cost and accessibility issues. So I'd, I'd love to get your thoughts. Um, look, that the balancing act of accessibility and affordability is you know, one that's constant and the responsibility is significant. And I think as companies think about how to balance that act, um, there, there, there's a lot of work in that area. There's no question. I think Gilead is a great example here just recently. I think they were very upfront about what supply they could, what they were capable of supplying. And that's why bringing on other companies to partner with them to make sure that as the science develops and if this product is going to show any hope for treatment, that they can quickly be able to ramp up and have these other companies ramp up production. So I think as one of the largest generic pharmaceutical companies in the world, our focus and vigilance on reaching as many people as possible, getting hands into the medicine or medicine into the hands of the people who need it has been our mission for 60 years. And I can assure you that that's front and foremost in our mind. I think that the pharmaceutical industry has cured many diseases over the hundreds of years that, that it's been in business. It's not only shown treatments and cures and has completely moved the needle on the quality of life that we live, but that's only as good as getting it where it needs to be. So yes, I think this industry will continue to come together and do the right thing and provide access to this medicine. And I think that obviously the costs that go into developing these products. Um, as you look across people's pipeline and products, there's no question there's cost and research mm -hmm. and development is expensive. But the ability to partner um, into lower cost um, economics and to lower cost countries, our ability to, like I said, reach those people is utmost important. We, we showed we could do that on HIV. And I think there's no reason we can't show that on COVID or any other crisis or disease that could be inflicted, you know, as we continue to be part of a very global economy. And just and just lastly, Heather, you know, you and I have talked many times about the ecosystem, the drug ecosystem, and, and you know, that there's a misunderstanding out there frequently about your industry. A lot of policy folks are watching this show. What do you think they most need to know, given your corner of this ecosystem right now in the time of coronavirus? What could they do to up their act? What could they do to be more constructive in supporting your mission? So I think two parts to that. I think our first discussion around strategic supply, I think here in the very near term, not trying to do something that would have significant unintended consequences. I've seen bills being proposed that talk about 
having only American produced medicine, I can assure you that would do way more damage than COVID has done to our to our society. So to be thoughtful about how we think about supply would be first. I think longer term, to your point, COVID is certainly illuminating the issues and the weaknesses of the drug supply system here in the United States from pricing to access. Mm. So do I think that we hopefully now COVID has certainly brought this front and center, and we should take this opportunity to absolutely study and look at the system, how, why we are where we are, and some of the fixes that it's gonna take. And it, they're, they're not easy, there's not one magic bullet, but we've continued to you know, very much believe there's a roadmap to have a more sustainable, a more transparent system, so that people know what they're buying, what the cost for what they're buying is, and how they're, employer or the government through their health care insurance can help supplement that. And today, all of those areas are very, very opaque. There's no transparency. And that's something that I believe very much needs to happen. I think that that's going to take a lot of leadership in Washington. It's going to take people from both sides of the aisle to come together. And hopefully, COVID is bringing a very unified look and response to this, because that's what it's going to take to fix to fix the broken system that we're participating in right now. Well, Heather Bresch, uh, Chief Executive Officer of Mylon, thank you so much for joining me today and sharing your thoughts on this. And I wanna thank all of you for joining me today. I'll see you tomorrow. I'm Steve Clemens, be well.